Today's cool fact of the day is that dimethyltryptamine, also known as DMT, which is the psychedelic compound that you'd find in ayahuasca, the sacred herb used by shamans in the rainforest down in South America, this chemical is released naturally by the brain during really intense experiences like birth, orgasm, and death. And the rest of the time you have these receptors and they don't really do very much. Today's guest knows a thing or two about DMT and her name is Amber Lyon. She is a three-time Emmy award-winning journalist, a filmmaker, photographer, and is pretty well known for immersion journalism where she becomes just a part of the story. She's done amazing things that she writes about on Reset.me, including looking at cultural and social and government demonstrations and how human rights violations, sex trafficking, sex trafficking and environmental issues are impacting the world around us. So very, very well studied. But the reason that I wanted to invite Amber on the show today is that she's looked and she writes a lot about using psychedelic medicines to cure things from depression to lack of motivation in life. If you've listened to the show for a while, you've probably heard me talk about going to South America and doing ayahuasca with a shaman back around 2000-ish. And not just that, but also medicinal use of what we would call magic mushrooms and a few other plant medicines have had a significant effect on how I see the world, how I see myself and how I perform. I'm not advocating, you know, crazy, let's go out and party and you know, go to Disneyland while tripping kind of things at all, but for science based use of these types of medicines. And that's why I wanted to have Amber on the show. Amber, welcome and thank you for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Dave. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Tell me something interesting about yourself. What's your own cool fact of the day? Like what would people not know about you? Um, they probably wouldn't know that, uh, I don't know, I, <laughs> that, that I'm a, an artist and photographer as well. Uh, I, I think that's something that uh, amidst all this muckraking journalism, I, I really have a, a very creative side and I'm, I'm really just a kind, chill person who, who just likes to create, whether that be journalism or art. That is, is super cool, but I don't think you're giving yourself enough credit, Amber. <laughs> Are you not the first reporter in history to scuba dive under the Deepwater Horizon oil spill live on air? <laughs> yes, I am. That, I'm sorry. Yes, that is my, you, my superhero uh, journalism side. You, I, you're kind of a badass. Just, that, that's what it comes down to, right? <laughs> it was really amazing. I, I really wanted to report on the BP oil spill in a way that connected viewers with what was happening underneath the water because... BP was kind of hiding the oil and sinking it into the water column, which is the top 10 feet of, of the ocean, which is the most vital uh, when it comes to biodiversity. So I was somehow able to convince CNN to throw me in a hazmat suit along with Philippe Cousteau. And, and we went down and, and we were able to show viewers live on air that, look, this oil is still there. It's just disappeared from sight. But we don't want it to be out of sight, out of mind. It's, it's still in, in the water and it's wreaking havoc on the ocean. I always thought when I was a kid that the easiest thing to do was to just like push everything under the rug or under the bed instead of actually <laughs> cleaning it up. And apparently that same thing worked for BP, right? It, it did. Like, I mean, they're they're brilliant. And that's why they spend millions on their PR campaigns. And I'm sure that's what these PR companies told them to do was get that get that oil out of sight right away so that helicopters and news helicopters can't show it. Because uh, if, if the photography is there and those images are there, it's going to look really uh, horrific to the public. So so that's what they did. They they used these dispersants that broke the oil into little beads and, and sunk it into the water. And from a PR standpoint, like you said, Dave, they, they, they were brilliant and, and it worked. I mean, uh, the BP oil spill is still causing a ton of damage in the Gulf, but it really isn't on the forefront of minds of, of Americans because this oil has been sunk. Which do you think was worse for the planet, the BP oil spill or Fukushima? That's a tough one. <laughs> It's hard. It's trying to choose between the lesser of two horrific yeah. evils for the environment. Uh, I think Fukushima scares me the most because we still have more than 20 plants of the same design as Fukushima operating in the United States right now. And that's a flawed design. The government has known since 1972. 
that it's been designed uh, flawed. It's because the cooling tower is raised above the ground. So you rely on this electricity to pump water up to the cooling tower. And if that electricity goes out, you have risk of a meltdown. And, and so scientists knew back in 1972 and told the U.S. government that this GE design plant was, was faulty. And unfortunately, the government didn't listen. And people have been screaming from the mountaintops that these plants need to be shut down and rebuilt. And unfortunately, uh, now we have Fukushima and potentially uh, a, a disaster could happen in the United States. So, so that to me is kind of more terrifying than, than even the oil spill. Wow. Uh, my grandmother uh, is a nuclear engineer, or at least she was till she retired. And that's kind of unusual for someone in her age. But uh, she met my grandfather on the Manhattan Project. And she's been saying, as long as I can remember, since the 80s, that reactor designs were completely primitive and we needed pebble bed reactors and we could do it safely. And she finally said, ah, they're never going to do it. And he went off and did her own thing. But it's it's shocking. But that's not the main thing I wanted to interview you about. It's just what an amazing story. You actually dove under that and you know something about this. What I wanted to get to with you is how did you get to the point of wanting to start Reset.me? Like, tell me a little bit more about what made you go from being this Emmy Award winning journalist to this new site. How did Reset.me come about? I was just at a time in my life where I had just seen too much in my career, Dave. <laughs> you know, one too many oil spills, and and I also covered co conflict zones, child sex trafficking, and unfortunately, I thought I had a, a big shield up surrounding yeah. me, protecting me from what I was witnessing, and I always pretended to be very strong. But uh, at the end of the day, many of us, especially as journalists, are absorbing the trauma we're yeah. witnessing. And I, I just got to the tipping point where I was starting to have symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. I was having trouble sleeping. I was always hyper aroused. If I heard a loud noise, like a door slam or a helicopter, I'd, uh, I'd start to freak out, maybe see tunnel vision. I, my mind was racing so quickly that I noticed I was having trouble. I was working on a book at that time and I was having trouble even sitting down and, and putting together sentences that made any sense. Wow. And at that point, I knew that I, I needed some type of help and I didn't want to go the prescription drug route uh, just because I have always been one who believes that Mother Nature has a cure for all of our ailments. And I had reported on the negative side effects of prescription medications throughout my career. So I started researching natural medicines and uh, a friend of mine had suggested psychedelics and then ayahuasca. And I was thinking I had grouped all psychedelics because I grew up in middle America where yeah. I fed all the propaganda. I drank all the Kool-Aid. So I thought all psychedelics were these evil drugs like crack mm -hmm. cocaine. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of them are behave more like medicines than drugs. And they've been unfairly grouped in this uh, Schedule 1 uh, grouping by the by the U.S. government. And, and so when I researched ayahuasca and I started reading anecdote after anecdote of people being healed from mental health disorders, including PTSD, that's when I knew, I, I just felt a calling, Dave. It was like Ayahuasca was calling me down to the jungle <laughs> and saying saying that I could be helped. That's remarkable. So you went down, but you didn't just do Ayahuasca. You talked about it, which is becoming more popular since Steve Jobs talked about LSD and uh, mm -hmm. Bono or Bono. I still don't know how to say his name um, properly. My apologies. I am a YouTube fan. I just never know how to pronounce that. But uh, they've all talked about how hallucinogens, particularly ayahuasca or other similar things, have changed the way they view the world and all. And for you, it sounds like they helped you with PTSD. You use them medicinally, not recreationally. Did someone help you do that or did you do this yourself? I, I definitely went and I'm like you. I, I highly recommend if you're going to take these substances, doing it in either a ceremonial setting yeah. or in a, in a very safe, comfortable setting surrounded by people who can not only watch out for you, but also have experience with these substances. And so for me, I went down to Iquitos and uh, went to a ceremony with about 14 other people and a shaman, also known as a healer. Uh, and we we're in almost a, a yurt-like structure and all sat there together for really beautiful ceremonies where we all consumed the ayahuasca at the same time, entered our journeys at the same time, finished around the same time, and then we're able to discuss the journeys together the next day to really integrate what we'd learned. So it, it was a beautiful process and extremely healing for me. It was I had been caught in this 
box of style of thinking, this Western mindset yeah. for my entire life. And the ayahuasca within 20 seconds just blew that to pieces <laughs> and showed me that there's so much more to the universe than, than we are experiencing right now, living, living in these boxes, driving around in these cars and, and living this consumer's lifestyle. And it also allowed me to process a lot of the trauma that I had stored up in my body. And there was even one time during the ceremony where I, I felt this presence in front of me just sucking something out of my body and these dark forms of energy just started flying out of my body one by one in uh, the, the shape of faces of people I'd interviewed over the years. So one of them was the face of a 13 year old sex trafficking victim who I'd done a documentary on. Another um, huge ball of energy was in the shape of all these animals I'd seen covered in oil during the oil spill and, and on and on and on until all of the trauma that I'd been carrying of others uh, had left my body. And, and then I was able to also go back and almost uh, while under the influence of ayahuasca, watch like a, a movie of my life and, and really see where the trauma in my life had started. And that was in my childhood my parents had had a pretty tumultuous divorce. And many of us don't realize this, but we're carrying around childhood trauma that takes the driver's seat for our entire <laughs> lives, you know? And so for me, that, that had caused, uh, just witnessing that as a young child, A, it caused me to question authority, which is really good for journalism, yeah. but B, it had caused me uh, a bit of anxiety. So I was able to go back and relive the fighting as a four-year-old, uh, but objectively this time, without the fear involved, the fear of abandonment. Instead, I just was able to watch it and, and kind of say goodbye to my four-year-old self and let her go on and be a child again and reprocess those memories, taking it from the fear and anxiety folder in my brain to the safe folder. And I, I noticed, uh, especially the weeks after my ayahuasca ceremonies, a tremendous reduction in, in my anxiety symptoms. Are you familiar with Stan Groff and his work with psychedelics? Yes, I am. Very familiar. Mm -hmm. So for people listening, Stan Groff is one of the fathers of modern psychedelic research. He did his work with LSD in the 50s, and he treated 10,000 people as a psychiatrist in Czechoslovakia back then and realized that there were current patterns. And what you're describing very much matches the sort of thing that, that he describes in his patients. And you might say, well, this guy was clearly a madman. And besides, it was Czechoslovakia. What did they know? Well, I've met Stan. I've actually done uh, holotropic breathing, which is a way of hallucinating without using psychedelics, which he invented after psychedelics became largely illegal. And okay, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a pretty successful guy. You know, I, I've done the Western walk very well. At the same time, just like you, Amber, you know, I, I realized when I was about 30 that I had all sorts of programming in me that wasn't mine. It all came from early childhood stuff. In my case, there was a lot that came from the way I was born. I was born with a, the cord wrapped around my neck. And when that happens, you come into the world ready to fight. And you don't really know that that happened because you're always, it's been like that since you were born. So, you know, you end up, pushing against authority and doing things like you did as well. And the many paths to see that programming inside you, I mean, there's meditation, there's awareness, there's things like EMDR, which is another kind of therapy. There's ayahuasca, there's DMT. Some people use ecstasy. Some people use many, many years of therapy. I've had the most success with neurofeedback, although psychedelics are as important to my own path as neurofeedback. How many of those different things did you try before you arrived at ayahuasca or did it just call to you and you went? I, I hadn't tried really anything. I tried wow. yoga and meditation, but I was so, my mind was moving so quickly. It was nearly impossible to quiet it. And, and so I, I remember reading somewhere, uh, it's, it's probably Groff's research as well, that psychedelics aren't the be all and end all, but often for many people that are, were in the state I was in, they're the key to unlock the door to healing. Yeah. And, and for some people that have tried everything, it, it's really their only option. And for me, uh, meditation and these other natural therapies, they, they just weren't working. And they, I knew my gut was telling me, you need something more powerful. And why not the most powerful psychedelic on earth? You know? <laughs> now, I, I don't want to 
dismiss meditation because meditation and, and particularly breathing techniques have, have been really helpful for me, but they're, you know, they're the Tylenol. <laughs> they're not the codeine. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Exactly. There are faster paths. And if you are going to, uh, we'll say if you have a mission in, in your life and you end up spending two thirds of your life dealing with childhood trauma that put a, a pattern that's very hard to discern into the way you interact with the world, why would you spend all of your time and energy using low powered techniques when there is an opportunity to choose from a, an array of faster, maybe scarier, certainly scarier, more, even more risk prone techniques, but ones that get you to the point where, okay, now I see my programming. Now I can rewrite the code so that now I'm in charge of my biology and I'm in charge of how I interact with the world instead of letting like primitive defense systems pick that for me. Uh, did that's you do a any... beautiful way to describe it. Oh. I, I that's what that's... I felt like. I, I felt like I'm only on on this planet for a short amount of time, and I've got a lot of work to do, and I, I just need to get better as as quickly as possible. And yeah. I was able to. I, I could only imagine. I mean, it would have been decades to go through all of this therapy and process had I not gone the psychedelic route. And I know that 100. percent It to me, it seems kind of like a sin to waste this life on you know, all of it, I, I just have to heal my trauma and eventually I'll stop being a victim and I'll feel better. So the, the first half of my life, I was more like, you know what, I'll just ignore all that crap and I'll just kick ass and, you know, I'll be invincible and invulnerable. Uh, and I was really damn successful. I just wasn't happy. Slight little problem there. And, and, you know, the mind's racing all the time and, you know, there's, there's fear, but you never show it and all that. Um, it is, though, just almost unimaginable for a lot of people to say, you know, I have my life and my job and maybe my family and I'm going to disappear to South America, use some plant medicines and come back a week or two later and maybe I'll be different. Um, were you worried that you might not like <laughs> what happened or, or what you would be when you came back from such an intense experience? I was in such a state where I, I knew I had hit rock bottom, so I knew I could only go up from there. Yeah. But I also, I did have a bit of a fear because I'd read some accounts online of people having horrific experiences that they couldn't process. And that sometimes is the case with ayahuasca. Not every experience is pleasant. So that's why it's key to make sure to go down there for 10 days or more if you need intensive healing. Because one night might be the night from hell. Then the next night is the most beautiful ceremony where your heart just opens up and you're filled with love and this understanding of the universe and spirituality. But yeah, it's you never know what you're gonna get, so you have to make sure to really, really give it a chance. And, and I just, uh, like I said earlier, my gut just told me that that this would be a medicine that could help me. And so I, as I get older, I'm learning to finally trust that little voice inside your head that gives you amazing advice that you don't always listen to. And and so I'm really glad that 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 time I I had trust. In, in my instincts. You, you were very fortunate that you had that both awareness of your instinct and your trust in it. Um, I, I grew up in a, a very science oriented family uh, where, you know, it's all very hardcore rationalist stuff. And, and there's value to examining double blind studies and to examining the rational perspective on things. But I'd actually learned inadvertently to not trust my intuition because no one else could validate my intuition. Uh, mm -hmm. So for me, there was a, a time of learning to do that. Now I listen to my intuition and I actually train my intuition with feedback and all where you can learn to become more aware of what your body is telling you, because even though the body will sometimes um, betray you, <laughs> other times it's got <laughs> knowledge you don't have because it's more wired to your environment than your conscious brain. Um, when you're using a, a plant medicine, there's I, I can think of like four variables that really come into play. There's the medicine itself. There's you, there's the healer you're working with, and then there's the set and setting and all of that. And a lot of times people sort of ascribe the power to the medicine. In your experience, how important is the medicine itself versus the interaction of the healer and the medicine in you? Like It seems like the healer is the variable that doesn't get as much attention, but it's pretty important. Especially with ayahuasca, it's yeah. vital that you go to a reliable shaman uh, because there's a lot of other factors at play. And so, A, you need to make sure your shaman has the right intentions because the medicine, just like everything in life, can be used for a lot of good, but it could also be used uh, to harm or take advantage of individuals. So the healer is of utmost importance when, when trying ayahuasca. And also the setting is vital, too. These aren't 
medicines. Ayahuasca isn't something to order and put in your refrigerator and, and drink with friends in your kitchen. <laughs> you know? It's going to be it's messy. Vital. <laughs> and I hear people ordering this thing, Dave, called Pharmawaska or, or some okay. kind of uh, ayahuasca analog online. And, and you're losing everything. The whole point of the ayahuasca is to ingest these plants and then get knowledge from these plants while you're on the ayahuasca from, from their spirits. I know that sounds so hippie. And just a reminder, I am a serious investigative journalist, but I've, I've seen not all of this can be explained by science. It's, there's a lot of spirituality and, and spirits and mysticism involved in this healing. And and it really makes a difference, too, to be in the jungle where ayahuasca came from, drinking this ayahuasca that's been growing for a thousand years, that has a thousand years of, of energy in it, and and really to just be in that, that natural setting. Uh, it's not vital. A lot of people are finding therapeutic healing from ayahuasca in Brooklyn or in, mm-hmm. here in L.A., uh, but, but if you are able to get all of those factors, a, a good healer in the jungle, in a ceremonial setting with the right mindset too. You have to really focus on what do you want from this medicine? What what are you trying to heal? Uh, and and really ask for that and, and think of that clearly in your mind before you ingest the ayahuasca. Then you're going to have a an amazing ceremony if you get all those those factors right. Uh, very uh, very well said. And the way you say I'm a hardcore investigative journalist you're you're a smart intelligent accomplished award-winning rational human being uh, who's probably performed at a level beyond what most humans have to be perfectly honest Uh, i like to think the same things about myself and not that i'm award-winning but you know everything else there i I would like to sign up for anyway but what coffee's fantastic so (laughs) uh, well thank you um it's it's one of those things where it's a bit scary to come out and say, yeah, there's a spiritual aspect to all of this. But when you, when you just flat out admit that, that other people who are high performers who have the same experience, but don't talk about it, will come forth and, and share the same thing mm-hmm. about oh geez, a long time ago when LinkedIn first started, I put yoga and meditation in my keywords. I, I'm a computer hacker, cloud security guru kind of guy from my background in fact, I quit my job like in January of this year uh, or December of last year, whatever, uh, and went full time bulletproof. So all that time, I would say maybe one in five people who'd seen my profile would be like, hey, I noticed you had this in there. I also have this spiritual side of my life, but I don't talk about it because like I want to maintain my credibility. And I'm like, well, my credibility is just going to be based on my accomplishments. And if I'm able to do those accomplishments with a spiritual side to what I do, you know, if you're not going to like me, you're going to think I'm a crackpot for that. I I guess I'll just take the hit and it's okay. Do you find that more people, now that you've just kind of really become open with reset.me, do more people sort of approach you about that? Are you attracting them to you? Or are these people who would have always had these practices, but just never felt safe talking about them? A little bit of both. People are really scared to say the G word, God. (laughs) I I just published a story on Reset.me about a young man who says that psychedelics helped him find God and reconnect with a sense of spirituality. And I got a little bit of criticism, like, don't use the word God. You're going to scare people away and and freak people out. And I've noticed that I, I think a lot of people have been kind of disappointed uh, or with their spirituality has been harmed potentially by the concept of organized religion or they've just been really let down by their traditional concept of spirituality. And so a lot of people are just floating around right now searching for something and they don't know, they don't know what that is. And so maybe they're fulfilling that need with other things like addictions or depression or anxiety. And psychedelics offer people a tremendous amount of, of spirituality. And I, you're giving me the courage to admit it here. <laughs> but it's true. For me, I had lost all faith in in, in afterlife and, and in God. You just and, use the F word and the G word. That would yeah, be I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I had. I, I had lost faith in a higher power. And, and especially with the ayahuasca, I had a tremendously powerful ayahuasca experience where I was shown that death doesn't exist. I, I was alive outside of my body as the real me, which is not the be- this organic spacesuit that allows the real me to survive on Earth, but really this vibration, this soul that will continue on forever and ever, whether this spacesuit survives or not. And, and that was so 
powerful and left such a, an imprint on my mind that I've completely lost all of my fear of death. And, and not only that, I've connected with a, a deep sense of spirituality, which is like a fire in my belly that gets me excited to wake up each day and smell fresh air and look at nature and, and just makes me excited to be alive again. It was such a beautiful experience. And that's what these psychedelics gave me. It was this gift from not only ayahuasca, but also uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, for me, the understanding that, that I am not this bag of meat and I'm not even responsible for all the feelings or sensations or, or thoughts that it interjects in my head uh, has been powerful. And to learn to, to discern when I'm actually getting information from, from the environment or some old program is sort of changing things for me has been a, a practice for me. Computers have helped a lot because if you have a lie detector, you're like, wait, am I deceiving myself or not? And I found out I am really good at self-deception. We all are. Uh, but having a computer sort of flash a red light every time I'm deceiving myself uh, in a neurofeedback chamber for me, helped me to understand something that really first came to me from holotropic breathing, which is you know, very related to psychedelics and isn't. So let's see, that was... That was actually after I had done ayahuasca. So I started a lot of this path with ayahuasca and then I ended up doing that. But it, it's that idea that, all right, this body is relatively temporary. Like I, <laughs> for me to come there from the way I thought the world was, it, it's as they're as far removed from each other as I, I could imagine. But mm -hmm. even if I'm totally wrong and I am just a bag of meat, I'm way happier thinking this bag of meat <laughs> is not me. <laughs> so I'm okay with that, right? Are you concerned about like teenagers doing psychedelics? I think that, well, if you look at native cultures, uh, especially with the psilocybin mushroom use in Oaxaca and in uh, the Amazon with ayahuasca, they give children uh, psychedelic medicines in a, in a therapeutic uh, setting. So as long as it's done correctly, I am, am not concerned, but, uh, but what I am concerned about is, is teenagers, A, potentially buying MDMA on the street or at concerts. Most MDMA is not real MDMA. It's some mixture of who knows what, so it's essential that they get a test kit. Also, uh, t a lot of teenagers will take these substances at a party or in a friend's house at a party in a setting they're not comfortable in. And, and maybe it makes them uh, have a bad experience or have a lot of anxiety and paranoia. So my biggest concern isn't teenagers using these medicines because naturally they've been used by individuals of these ages for hundreds if not thousands of years, but it's just doing it incorrectly, which is another reason I created Reset.me to really promote harm reduction journalism to really kind of take that jump and say, okay, we're not advocating for people to do these but if you are going to here's how to be safe to try to yeah. prevent people from having accidents it's it's so important i'm not opposed to the idea of of a teenager with a shaman or even a therapist using one of these things i mean for god's sake how many teenagers are on ritalin or adderall or one of the other methamphetamines uh, or coffee or alcohol or nicotine, like mind altering substances are just part of being human. Um, but I, I am gravely concerned about inducing more trauma by taking these things uh, or even inducing chemical harm to the brain at a time when the prefrontal cortex isn't even formed. Uh, you know, you and I talk about early childhood things that form traumatic behaviors that are totally invisible to rational high performance humans. The, the behaviors are there, but they're masked. If you're before about 23, 24, your prefrontal cortex isn't formed and you start doing this stuff without the things that come from having a healer work with you or a therapist work with you or just without the conscious use of these things, I think the risks are much higher because you haven't finished wiring your behaviors in. So if you jack things up, you could really, really harm yourself and I would not as a biohacker say it's reversible because I don't think there's much you can't reverse in your bag of meat if you have enough technology and knowledge and understanding of the system. But someone who's had 300 pounds or someone who's weighed 300 pounds, someone who had arthritis at age 14 and all these health problems and overcome them, 
it's an enormous amount of time and money and work and focus. And maybe if you could just do it right the first time, <laughs> you'll have a lot more energy and time yeah. to do other good stuff in life. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh, no, I want to go do ayahuasca. Number one, it's not a party drug. You're going to throw up. It's not actually fun. It may be absolutely terrifying. It may be absolutely spiritual and uplifting, and it may be healing. It can also not be healing if you think you're going to take it at a party. Like, just don't mess around. Go with someone who's yeah. done it before. And I say that not because I'm old. Uh, I say that because, well, you know, I've made mistakes myself. <laughs> I agree with you 100%. And that's that's another reason why uh, people are always – it's always – safer to go with the plant medicines and the more natural uh, substances when you know if you're getting on a plane and going down to Peru, what you're drinking is ayahuasca, or if you go to a mushroom ceremony, you know what you're eating is a mushroom versus some of these other synthetic substances that you don't necessarily know what you're getting. And when, when teenagers do use these substances in these natural cultures, they are always doing it in a ceremony, ceremonial setting. They're never just sitting on a street corner drinking ayahuasca. It's always with a trained healer in a, in a train, which would be, like you said, Dave, that would be pretty <laughs> horrific because people do uh, – ayahuasca is abortive. So people are throwing up out of, out of both ends, sometimes simultaneously, and it's, it's not pleasant. Yeah. It, in fact, one of the things that will make you more human – is confronting death and traditional cultures had ways to do this lots of ways but but knowing with some degree of certainty what it feels like to die or believing you're going to die will cause beneficial changes because you lose the innate fear of dying and that's something you mentioned it's something that i've experienced as well when you're sure you're going to die and you don't uh, and you and you face that fear it loses the edge and you stop making small little de unconscious decisions that you were doing because you were so afraid of dying. Like, all right, maybe I'm going to die, maybe I'm not, but I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And that inner calmness can make you a better CEO, a better investigative journalist, and just a better person. Like, it, it doesn't, it's not just about like your job. It, it can make you a better nonprofit person or just a better mom, whatever. Uh, so, that said, if you think you're going to face death at a party, <laughs> <laughs> that idea is just wrong and on a street corner is hilarious. Well, it may be. Some might, might and, and have this horrific experience and then it turns out being beneficial. You, you never possible. know. But but it, it helps to have someone with you the next day, a trained healer who can explain what you've just witnessed and really guide you through that that process so that you can – the key to psychedelics is not just taking the psychedelic and going through the experience. It's how you integrate it after the experience and knowledge and this incredible insights you've been given, what, what do you do with those afterward? And that's why it's great to have a, a trained healer or trained uh, individual who knows a lot about the medicines with you so they can help you come up with your plan of action after you've had these experiences. And for me, just as a journalist, I had a fear of death for because I'd witnessed uh, people killed and, and friends and friends imprisoned. And that had been, I didn't realize how much that was in the driver's seat of my life, causing me so much anxiety and and fear. And now that I've been able to overcome that, just like you said, Dave, I do have a great sense of calmness. People notice it about me. They're like, wow, you're just glowing <laughs> and, and you're so relaxed all the time. And I definitely wasn't this way before. I'll, I'll definitely, you know, my friends and family and ex-boyfriends can attest to that. But, um, but now I just have this inner peace and look at how many of us, our lives are just totally controlled by this fear of death and we don't take risks and and we don't you know make new moves and and we're just constantly oh my gosh that person's going to kill me we don't connect with our neighbors we we don't love because we have such an intense fear and that's what's really beautiful about uh these substances and allowing people to just shed that and then which just unveils this beautiful human being that can peacefully enjoy their time on earth after you've had these these remarkable experiences that describe that, um, what changed in your life? Like, well, how do you define success now compared to what you did before? Well, everything changed. <laughs> My life has been turned uh, right side up, as I like to say. And now I I used to be really um, I used to be more concerned about money. And I was always worried about if, if I'm going to go broke or I can't make that decision because I need to, I need to instead do a job that has more security and, and be more on this 
traditional linear path, uh, which was never really traditional for me, but, but I did constantly have that fear. And now what has changed dramatically in my life is I have completely surrendered, which in my surrender has given me so much freedom because now I have trust in the universe that everything's going to work out. For example, for, with the site I created, Reset.me, some people told me I was crazy because I didn't have a business plan and I didn't have investors. And, but what I did have was my insight and my gut and this vision, if you build it, they will come. And so what I did was I just built it. I, I, I got rid of all the fear and the resistance and all the naysaying and, oh, you're going to be criticized for promoting these medicines and these alternative forms of healing. I just let that go and I surrendered and I said, I'm going to trust in the universe that this will work out. And it has. I mean, we had almost a million people on the site last month. Congratulations. And That's huge. Thank you. Thanks. It was, it, it just, it's just like things are falling in place. Cause when you follow your gut and you follow that passion <laughs> and surrender to the universe, which these medicines have shown me to do, things just fall into place. And we've had, you know, people contact us for advertising and, and other positive things that just have fallen magically into place for us. And had I had such fear uh, that the psychedelics dissolved, but had I had that fear, I don't think I would have, uh, started on this new journey and would have lost out on, on a lot in life for letting fear rule my life. Now, a lot of that sounds entirely irrational and unscientific. The, the universe will take care of you. Things will happen the way they're supposed to happen. Um, how do you address critics who just say, come on, you know, you, you drank the Kool-Aid uh, pretty much literally. And, and now you just believe all these magic fairy tales, but it's all coming to an end soon. Like, like what, yeah. <laughs> how do you address well, that? Well, cause normally I just ask them, are you happy? Are you happy working <laughs> in your cubicle, working from <laughs> nine to five? Or do you want to be uh, an opera singer or a ballroom dancer? Yeah. Or what, what is your in at each of us is on this planet uh, down a certain path for a reason. We, we have a destined path. But so many of us are unhappy and depressed and anxious because we're not following that path, because we constantly sit in our, in our cubicle, ignoring that voice in our head that says, you should be doing this. This is what you're passionate about. And, and so that's what, that's what I usually just ask them, if, if they're happy. And nine times out of ten, uh, the, the naysayers aren't. And, and so I, I'm trying to hopefully advocate for them to, to follow their passions as well, because when you're passionate about something, you're going to be doing that better than 90% of, of people doing it because you're being driven not just by money, but you're being driven by heart and soul and, and, and this intensity that's going to surpass the others. And yeah, maybe it's a risk making ballroom dancing a career, but if you are passionate, you're going to be the best damn ballroom dancing <laughs> coach in in your city and everyone's going to want to come to you which will then bring bring money and and success it it takes an enormous amount of courage to sort of leap off and do that and i, I started bulletproof the same way i had a perfectly good job uh, for a big company uh, able to take care of my family but the cubicle life even though i managed to get to work from home but the cubicle life still doesn't bring value to me anyway and uh, i finally did go full time with with bulletproof like i was mentioning but I started the blog without a business plan, without investors, same sort of thing. I said, I'll take a little bit of my, my salary and I'll you know, cover costs. And I just want to help a few people because some of the things I've come across matter. And you know, like you, a million people, like that's incredible. And even this podcast, like it, it's number one ranked much of the time in health and fitness on iTunes and um, more than a human lifetime of, of people have, or have downloaded it. So I, I look at you know, 7 million downloads times about an hour. Like that's more than a life. So I like to make sure that we don't waste, uh, we, we don't waste people's time listening to it because that would be like killing somebody. That's not okay. <laughs> and did you just have this instinct that told you uh, about putting the the butter and the coffee and the, the oils? I mean, what was it in you? Because I imagine it's, it's similar to my path. It's something that is so untraditional. Uh, but but thankfully you you followed that and it's it's brilliant. I mean, how oh, how many people you. out there? Are, if you had told someone, I'm sure they probably said. If you had said to them, I'm going to put I'm going to show people to put butter in their coffee, people might have thought you were insane. And now look, <laughs> they still do. <laughs> yeah, but it, but so many people love it, and I you know including myself and um, and I you know it's really amazing that you followed that gut instinct to create this product. 
regardless of what anyone else thought, because that was your path. That's your destined path and your passion. And, and you followed it and look at all the success you're having because of it. Well, you talk about sort of having uh, intuition and following your, your calling. I read an article about Mount Kailash, like sometime in the early, early 90s. Mount Kailash is you know, the headwaters of the Ganges and Indus rivers. It's the for the Hindu and Buddhist religions where you know the gods live. It's a very holy place. Few Westerners go there. It's five days of driving on dirt roads to get there. And then you walk for 26 miles at high altitude over rough terrain in a circle around this. And I thought, this sounds like the coolest like thing ever. And I thought, I don't know if I'll ever have a chance to do it. And events just sort of came together when I was traveling in Southeast Asia for a few months, um, taking some time off, and I had a chance to to go there. So, you know, the right traveling companions sort of just manifested themselves, and I ended up going. And it was at that high altitude where I drank yak butter tea for the first time. And I'm like, I've done high altitude mountaineering in South America, in Ecuador, and in Peru, and I always feel like crap. So I'm drinking this weird concoction, and I'm feeling amazing. And I just remember thinking, why would these nomadic people who have to carry all this carry all this stuff when they move with yaks, like a third of the population there, why do they carry big butter churns? And why do they have blenders? Like they have little generators and batteries and blenders. And it was to make yak butter tea. And so I tried to replicate it, and I played with that idea when I came back. And, of course, I'd always been a coffee guy, and I'd known about the mold problem a little bit in coffee, but I hadn't understood how big of an impact it was having on my immune system and all. So bringing together that stuff just happened. And I put it up there saying, look, this here's how to find coffee that's probably lower than average. And here's how to mix butter and this other oil and all into it uh, after just iterative tries. And for me, I just wanted to feel good all the time because I never did my whole life. I was always struggling against a lack of energy and just being tired and having brain fog. And like you said, sort of like, not necessarily even remembering, you know, what, what's going on because you're trying to write a coherent sentence, but your, yeah. your nervous system is like all over the place. Right. I was like that too. And so I found that I got this, this feeling from it. And then when I did a, a study actually of, of people's cognitive function, it was there. So that's how it came. It was intuition and science blended together and uh, just a sincere desire to make people feel like their brain is turned on all the way. Because my experience is that if I'm going to manage my biology fully, then I want my brain working to do that. And my brain actually never worked that well on its own. It, it worked in some domains remarkably well as an entrepreneur, but in other domains, not so well. So it was bringing that all together. It, it, so it's kind of a long answer to your question, but it's it's an interesting thing that, that you know, I wouldn't have predicted that that was the number one thing people would talk about on the blog. I would have thought like the diet infographic roadmap, which is the topic of the book that's coming out, which has hundreds of references in it, that that would be the amazing thing. And it is, but it's number two after the coffee. <laughs> it's great. But it, it's just another example of just following your passion and trusting that inner voice. And, you know, it may be a lonely path walking alone for a bit, but others will join you, especially if you're doing something that you truly know deep down in your soul is, is right and effective. That is very, very well said. <laughs> we are coming up on the end of the show. And there is a question that I've asked every guest and what I'd like to ask you. And given all the things you've learned, not just as an investigative journalist, not just on your path using psychedelics for healing, um, but just as a human being, the three most important pieces of advice you'd have for people who want to perform better. I don't mean perform better in sports mm. or their job. I mean perform better as human beings. Top three. Uh, I'd say you have to purge your trauma because for oft, often for many of us, in your case, in my case, and probably the majority of, of humans on this planet, uh, that often gets in the driver's seat and can potentially take you down a path that is not your, your true path in life. So I'd say purge your trauma. Um, you need to get rid of your fear. Uh, fear stands in the way of your dreams. Fear is resistance to being your highest self. And I've seen fear uh, ruin lives. And you're only on this planet for a short time. So if you're going to let fear run your life, then fear is going to ruin your life. And then also, uh, as I said earlier, follow your passion. Go with what makes you happy. Life is so short to be spending your days doing something that, that you don't enjoy. And if you do follow your passion, you're going to be doing that job better than 90 plus percent of people in that industry. And because of that, success will follow. 
and look at all of the most successful people on this planet. It's they're successful because they're doing what they love. And how amazing is that to be able to do something every day that is something you love and just have that enrichment and nourishment um, to, to go through life knowing you are on your soul's true path. Powerful words. <laughs> Amber, where can people learn more about your work? Where can they find you online? I'm at uh, reset.me is uh, the website covering all these natural medicines and therapies. And my Twitter handles at Amber Lyon. And I'm also on uh, Facebook as well. We have a Reset Me page and an Amber Lyon fan page. And, um, and pretty much with using the three of those, you can figure out what, what I'm up to these days, which is often uh, a little bit of muckraking and, uh, and trying to show you know, peace and, and change a lot of love. So. Well, thanks for being so honest and courageous and just, just up front on the show and in life. Uh, I appreciate and admire that and have an awesome day. All right. Thank you. I'm a bulletproof babe. And, and we totally didn't. You need that t-shirt. You need the bulletproof babe t-shirt. Oh, my God. I'm taking oh, a note on. We're kidding. I'm taking yes. a note on that one. Um, thank you. So, so pe people, <laughs> people really should know that like we don't sit ahead of time going, oh, let's talk no, about talk each about other's products. See the head of foam that's formed on it? This is similar to what you get with a latte.